Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Lopez, and I have Charles Roberts with me. And today we've got the webinar on analyzing a cash flow property into in today's Denver market. So before I jump into it, I know we actually switched the schedule around about a week and a half ago from doing it Tuesday morning to Thursday morning. And I sent out the email, but I don't think I sent it out correctly through our new webinar platform. So now Andrea and Jim, I saw you guys post some comments out there about showing up. Um, probably some other people out there too. I apologize. Um, so we did switch the schedule and we did not do a good job of giving everyone a heads up. So next time we all get together, coffee is on Charles. I'll volunteer you, volunteer you Charles. Uh, anyway, getting on with it. So what we're going to do is actually walk through a recent property that we helped a client purchase and just really uh, understand how to analyze the numbers, how to put them in the spreadsheet, and then how to interpret the results. So please ask questions while we are doing it. This is meant to be a, be a very interactive live webinar. So ask questions. We are monitoring them. And if you don't have a copy of the spreadsheet, uh, email us right now. Or I'll actually, I'll put a link in the notes uh, here once we get going. Download it. It's a free download. We don't charge for it. It is provided courtesy of Joe Massey, who's a lender with Castle & Cook. So Charles, good morning. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Great. Well, We've got a spreadsheet in front of us. Let's dive into it and tell us what is going on here. Okay, great. So I'm first going to start with the MLS sheet. Can you see this okay, Chris? Yes. And okay. can you zoom in on that just a tad? Absolutely. That's possible. Yeah, that's, that okay that's looking better. Okay. This is a property uh, that we closed on recently. I thought it was a, a, just a good example of, of what the types of deals that we do in this market. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go through the MLS sheet in some detail and just show you. You might be asking yourself if you're listening to this to this webinar, you know, what are people buying in Denver? You know, can you what do you have to pay? What do the returns look like? So this one right here is pretty typical. So um, we looked at this a couple of months ago. It was an investor of mine that has some experience investing. She actually you know, knows what she's doing. And she, she said, look, I want to buy a few more cash flow properties. Let's go find something that's going to be good for my long-term retirement. And I said, great. So we went out and looked and we saw this property, 9248 East Lehigh Ave in Denver. And we liked it. So let me run through some of the numbers. They were asking $270,000. You see that up here. Um, it is an attached single family. So basically, you know, English would be it's a townhome. You can see it's this townhome right here. So it's two stories, nice community, uh, no basement, built in 1965. <clears throat> it was four bedrooms, two baths. Uh, and it was large, 1,584 square feet, which is, you know, a good, a very comfortable size for a four bedroom, two bath. It wasn't like one of these jack things where they stuck an extra bedroom someplace. Um, it's just a very comfortable, very normal, very easy four bedroom. Come down here, you see it just had, you know, refrigerator, microwave, stuff like that. And then keep on moving down. A uh, couple things we liked was, uh, let's see, right up here, adjacent to a green belt. So it's actually was kind of nice. You can see from the park, this right here, there's actually another set of units over here, but a nice little area right here for the kids and the dogs to play. So just, just, just an easy place, pretty solid. Um, so here's the first thing I want to point out. Incredibly, the listing said it had a $140 monthly fee. And if you know anything about the Denver market, that's a very, very low fee for a $270,000 townhome. So the listing agent is actually a friend of mine, Ellen Smirnoff. I've done, I've done deals with her. Uh, I was a board member at the Denver uh, Board of Realtors for five years, and she was a colleague of mine. She's really, really good, very thorough. And I called her even before I went out and looked at it. It's like, Ellen, hey, you know, going to go take a look at Lehigh. But did you make a mistake? 140 bucks? She's like, no, no, it's 140. But you know what? Let me check. Very thorough. I said, great. Yeah, just go ahead and check. And she came back and it was $140. So one of the things we liked about this property a lot was that the HOA was very, very low. And it came with a bunch of stuff. You see right here clubhouse, community pool, tennis courts, fitness facility. This is actually quite rare. And by the way, this property, of course, was on the MLS. I'm showing you an MLS listing. It was out there for the 3.1 million people in the front range to take a look at. Nothing special about that, but hmm, we really liked that it was a low HOA. The numbers came out a lot better, and that's what I'm going to do next is go through the numbers. 
And before you do that, Charles, and she just yeah. mentioned you found the MLS. So was this property like way overpriced and it's been sitting in the market for months? Is it a beat up property? Like how come you're able to find this? Um, no, I'm trying to think. It listed on 3.9. I'm guessing it had just come on the market a day or two when we looked at it. Um, I don't know. It was, it was basically market price. I thought she priced it pretty well. And by the way, I mean, cut to the chase, we got it under contract for 270000 meaning by definition, the market price was 270000 So um, I, I think where we're going with this is, you know, was this a great deal? Was this the world's greatest deal? The answer is no, it, it really isn't. Um, but that's something that we counsel people a lot is if you want the world's greatest deal, then you have a very low chance of buying anything. That's neither good nor bad. You just have to understand that there's a relationship between wanting a great deal and how much work and effort and time you're going to have to put into it. Good or bad, you just decide. Um, this client of mine wanted something that fit her portfolio. She wanted the return that she wanted, which I'll show you next on the spreadsheet. And it was the right deal for her. So I think that answers your question. It had pretty much just come on the market, yep. went and looked at it the first day or two. And that's that's what it was. I mean, just like, you know, not the most interesting story in the world. It's just kind of the story we do over and over again. This is how real people actually buy properties oftentimes and build wealth over time. Just a, a perfect example of that. Um, any any other questions on that? Happy to keep going. Nope. Let's dive into the numbers or keep going. Okay. So here are the public remarks, you know, and, and, you know, again, nothing overly special, a four bedroom, one of the best locations in Denver. Yeah, that's, that's a, that's not true. <laughs> I mean, it was a nice place. It was an absolute B community. Um, I, I'm kind of laughing about this. I don't even remember reading this, but no, not one of the best locations in Denver, but a perfectly reasonable location. Uh, all new flooring throughout had actually nice carpets, big kitchen, large bedrooms, two car carport. And that was nice, you know, but, and you see it right up here. A two car carport was nice. Lots of green space and extremely low HOAs. Um, just a solid property, you know, real simple, easy to rent. And from there, basically, that was it. It was a quick move in, quick possession, meaning that it was vacant, which it was. And we were able to get in, no problem. So let me stop there and see if you or anybody who's listening has any questions on this property. No, I mean, I don't have any questions. And I don't see any questions coming in here. Okay. So, yeah. All right, so guys, if, you have, if you have questions, go and ask them. So. Yeah, feel free. Yeah, I've got the questions up here. I think you can see, but always like to answer questions. So feel free. Anything you like. Um, sounds nice and simple so far. Yes, thank you. Straightforward so far. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, David. It is straightforward. Uh, okay, literally, um, I'm in my kitchen right now, and my 16-year-old is asking if he can um, turn on the ice machine. Yes, Jack, turn on the damn ice machine. Okay, I'm back. So he's actually going to work right now and he needed ice because he's uh, working with little kids. All right, I'm back. So now let's look at the spreadsheet. So this is a spreadsheet that was put together by Joe Massey of Castle & Cook, who's a phenomenal lender. And he took the time and did some really great work by putting together a very simple and straightforward spreadsheet that is real powerful. So the bulk of this discussion now is going to be showing you how to input into this spreadsheet, which we're happy to send to you for free. Use a spreadsheet to understand and be a better investor. So the great thing is you see there are cells that are yellow and there are cells that are white. Guess what? You can only input in the cells that are yellow. It's ridiculous, but it's so intuitive that he did that. So you don't have to wonder, hmm, where do I input? Only on the yellow ones. So here, this is literally the spreadsheet I put together for Lynette so that we could evaluate the property and say, yeah, does this make sense for your portfolio? And the answer was yes. So property address, number of units, you can actually do up to a four unit on this. Uh, down payment percentage, 25% down. Um, and we're using that for this example. Purchase price, we did get it under contract for $270,000. And then here, what you see is we have acquisition cost and uh, we put in about $2,000 of um, just things you need to do, appraisals and inspections and stuff like that. So that's kind of a, you know, that's that's the number we use. Um, and then this right here is the hardwired stuff, the loan cost. So that's if you do the loan through Joe, the loan cost would be $13.95. And the down payment, 25%. 
would be 67,500, the mortgage balance. We put in a thousand bucks for repairs. Um, the place was in good shape, but uh, it's kind of funny. Um, the inspection came back that the microwave didn't work and the dishwasher didn't work. And it turns out they did work. <laughs> so we put in about a thousand bucks for repairs. We actually ended up coming in a little bit below that. But what's really neat is this actually, for the purposes of calculations, we coded it that the initial repair costs is added to the purchase price in terms of the calculations. So you get a more, um, more accurate calculation because if you have a property that's 270,000 with no repairs required and you have another one that's 270,000 with 50,000 repairs required, well, obviously they're apples and oranges. So the second one would actually calculate at a $320,000 purchase price, which makes perfect sense. In this case, it's two, 270 plus 1000 for repairs. Good so far. Is that making sense? Any questions, Chris? Does this sound good? Yes. It's good. And, yes, uh, good. And, uh, Something to, something to, oh, I can hear myself. Oh, I can hear myself through your speakers. I think. Okay, that sounds better. I'll say one question: um, Why does it only go up to four properties on the spreadsheet? It's a great question because Joe is a conventional lender. <laughs> That's exactly why, because conventional lenders can only do up to four properties. So, um, you know, I mean, that's just the way he coded it because that's what he does. Now, the truth is, let's say, you know, uh, David, you're on right now. And let's say you're doing a five unit. Well, no problem. I'll show you in a minute how you can just do the calculations for a five unit. You would just do the rents based upon the total rents. You might call it a one unit and then just calculate the rents for the all five units. So it works just as well. But and that's just, the answer. Just to get a more detail here, since lending gets very detailed, uh, after what? Five units above, it turns into commercial lending, which is a whole different animal, right? It is. It's a whole different animal, um, but it's not. It shouldn't. It shouldn't worry you overly. It's just another thing you need to learn. And if you want to do larger multi-units, you want to learn the commercial world. Uh, so, for example, for a conventional, you might put you know twenty or twenty-five percent down. Interesting, for a commercial, it's pretty much the same thing. For a four unit, it's going to be 25% down minimum. Um, the big difference is you're not probably going to get long-term financing. Mostly, you won't get 15-year and 30-year fixed rate, fully amortized loans like you would on a conventional. That, in today's current world, that's the big difference between conventional five I'm um, sorry, one to four unit type loans and commercial portfolio loans like from a first bank or a vector or a guarantee bank that would be five plus units. Good to know. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Great. All righty. So let's see uh, the total. So the, the great thing is it's already starting to do calculations for you. Your total initial investment is seven one eight ninety five. Uh, the mortgage interest rate at the time that we were doing this a few months ago was about four and three quarters. We looked at it on a 30 year. And this is uh, something that we can come back to where you can actually calculate, well, what if you add, say, $100? You make a $100 extra payment every month. How quickly can you pay it off? It does neat things like that. We put in um, the rent of 2050, which was our best guess, which is actually pretty accurate. Um, I happen to like Section 8 um, government-sponsored voucher housing a lot, and we've done some other four bedrooms, and it was right about the 2050 mark for a four bedroom like this. And then here are imports that you can make um, for vacancy, rent increase, and appreciation. And when and if you get this, just do whatever you want to do. I'm going to tell you these are the numbers that I generally use. Vacancy rate of about 5%. It's at about 3% right now. So, uh, there have been periods of time when it's been over 10%. My guess is for the next few years, it's probably going to remain low as we have way more demand and too little supply. But again, put whatever you want. <clears throat> Annual rent increase, 4 or 5%. That's what we've seen over the long term. Annual appreciation, 5 6% over 40 years. So basically, I come in with all fives here. But again, I don't want you to use my numbers because I say to use them. I want you, the listener, to learn about the market and put in whatever numbers you feel most comfortable with. And something and I want to jump in here with just, I mean, because you touched on those numbers really fast, the vacancy, annual rent and appreciation rate. Charles teaches very often the Denver Metro Trends class or in a webinar format. And that's an hour long uh, dive into the data that actually talks about historical perspectives on that. So you want to kind of know why we're using those numbers. 
definitely go watch a recorded webinar or attend one of Charles's upcoming classes mm -hmm. and you'll get all the details on there uh, because that's those three things we can talk about hours for and why we choose those numbers. And uh, David asked a question, Charles, what's the best source for rental estimates? So David, believe it or not, Zillow. Can you believe that? But Zillow's really good. A couple of years ago, they came out with their rental and they, they obviously put a lot of money into it. It's very simple, very straightforward and actually quite accurate. So when I look, I actually start with Zillow. And then from there, you've got your hot pads, Craigslist, uh, Rentometer, and there's lots of others um, that you can pay for. Some are free, some you pay for, but Zillow is phenomenal. So I would start with Zillow and it's going to be right more often than wrong and kind of right more often than any other tools that I know. So that's what I would do. And if you have any other questions, yeah, we got it right here. Just uh, pop them over. Happy to chat about this. So continuing, let's now look at the annual operating expenses. So we are talked about the rents of 2050. Now we got to talk about what it takes to actually maintain this property. Taxes, as you can see right here, taxes are 1246. Uh, insurance 300. That's I pay between like 265 and 315 for all my condos and townhomes. So I think 300 was a solid estimate. My client manages her own property, so we have nothing here. Uh, we can talk about property management for a minute. It's going to be about seven to ten percent of the gross rent. So if it's two thousand bucks a month, it might be between one hundred and forty and two hundred bucks a month to have a professional property manager manage your rent. Um, in this case, Lynette she manages it her own herself, and that's fine. I manage my my own portfolio of properties. Other people think that's terrible, and they should man they should get a property manager totally whatever you think is right for you, but worth exploring either way. And then repairs and maintenance, that's that's the one we always get the most questions on because it's a, it's a very inexact science to know how much money you should put away. So we actually put a note here um, saying something like a minimum of 5% for repairs and maintenance. Here's the bottom line. You want to have a reserve fund. If the furnace goes down, you can't say to your tenant, sorry, I don't have any money. Like that just doesn't work. You've got to make sure that if the tenant leaves and for some reason you can't rent it for a while, you've got to make sure you're okay. So I would say um, be, be overly cautious and put more money away. That said, it tends to be in the five to 8% over the long term for reserves, but it totally depends. Let's say you're buying a 1912. I actually owned a, believe it or not, in Northwest Denver, I owned an 1868 triplex with a flat roof. That was one of the first properties I bought maybe 18 years ago. Um, it, it was a really, really interesting property. It was literally like the first property in Denver. I, I owned it on, on West 43rd. That one, well, maybe will be a little more than 5% because it was older. This one right here, you look at this, it's in nice shape. You know, you, the HOA is paying for the roof and stuff like that. I think, I think this is 5%. I actually can't do the math in my head, but I'm guessing this is about 5%. That's what I put for repairs and maintenance. Chris, how does that sound? Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I do, because it's real interesting. We did our roundup, our May roundup webinar two mornings ago, and you were actually talking about an, uh, a fourplex that you're listing in the very near future, and you had put together a spreadsheet with some you know, pro forma rents, but also some actual data from the last like four or five years that your client owned it. And we did a quick calculation on the webinar uh, because the repairs and maintenance were actually actual spread over the last four or five years that uh, the owner has had the property. And it came out at like 5.75% <laughs> or five and three quarters. And now it's actually based off of, um, you know, it's actually under rented right now. You know, rents are a little bit below market rents. So if you bumped up to market rents, it's probably right around that 5% mark. So, you know, it's yeah. not an exact science as Charles said, but it's a... Uh, it's a, a safe rule of thumb that we feel comfortable using. And of course, it's going to be like 0% the first year, 1% the second year, 0% the third year, and then 24% the fourth year. You just got to be prepared for the fourth year. That's all we're saying is be prepared. So what's like really the best practice for people? I mean, okay, so let's just say, you know, I buy this property or, you know, the client buys this property, zero maintenance that first year. I mean, that 5%. Do you take it and, and reinvest it or just keep it in the bank account? Like how, how should, how do you recommend people manage those no funds? I, I literally don't know. Cause I just made sure I always had enough money. Oh. And I'll tell you like my friends and colleagues who've done this for a long time, 
I find that we oftentimes say the same thing. It's like, Chris, it's like, that sounds like a good question. You'd think we'd have a good answer. We oftentimes don't. We just say, just have enough money put away. I don't care where it is. Just don't be stupid. You're going to have a furnace go sometime. You're going to have a tenant who's a problem. You might have an eviction. you got to be able to deal with it. So just have enough money. If you are the type of the person that wants to be meticulous and put away 6% and have it in a specific account, that's lovely. That's wonderful. I can just tell you, I never did that neither good nor bad. I just didn't do it. And most of my buddies and pals that have done this for a while, we kind of all sort of sheepishly admit we didn't really do that. We just want to make sure we have enough money. So bottom Something line that is, a, is probably a good, a good amount per year over time to make sure you can deal with problems. Great. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Great. And it's just a great discussion. Just, just, just make sure you have enough for a rainy day, no matter what. And then utilities. So, for example, if you have um, if it, if you have a, a duplex, you might be paying for the water, you know, water and sewer or some electrical. I actually have a duplex, the first one I ever bought on Forty Six and Miller Street. Um, I have public water for the units, but believe it or not, I have a well, and I have a well for all of the exterior water. So I pay the well pump charges. So we turn it on. We literally turn it on in April, you know, a couple of months ago. I think I paid maybe like 15 or 18 bucks a month or 20 bucks, whatever, to Excel for six months that we have it on. There it is. That would be a utility paid by owner on my Miller Street uh, duplex. So you have a, a well just, that is so weird. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It's actually a huge, like a third of an acre lot on 4637 Miller Street. Um, I bought it 20 years and one month ago. And I bought it from the guy who built it in 1972. And they put a well in. And they put the well. It's actually it's horse property. There are horses across the fence. Um, I have a well, you know, and a sprinkler. And um, I think we have a sprinkler system. I'm not sure if it works, though. But, the, you know, the tenants love it because they, they love to garden. They love to do stuff. I mean, literally their yards, their yards are better than mine, you know, so things you learn. So then you have your water, sewer, trash, electric, landscaping, because this is an HOA, there really isn't any of that. And that's a nice thing. And, and this right here is a wonderfully low number. HOA dues are really, really low. It's the 140 times 12 comes out to 1680. And then Joe was nice enough to say, great, I got a bunch of others, like account for everything you can think of, put it in. And that would be great. We got a question, thank you, Brian. Regarding the long-term maintenance costs, we've got a couple of savings accounts for unplanned rental expenses where we siphon a percentage of rents automatically every month, and that's worked pretty swell for the past several years. Nice and simple, and like Charles says, just have money in the bank. Perfect, I mean, that's exactly it. I've, I've always had, of course, a bank account for my rentals, and it sounds like we say where we siphon a percentage of rents automatically you know, three steps better than I ever did. But we're saying the same thing. Uh, as he quotes me, just have money in the bank, not complicated. Make sure you can survive any rainy days. The bottom line here is we oftentimes lose the, what is it, the, the forest for the trees. The trees are getting things out to the 16th decimal point. The forest is buy some property, own it for 20 years, you will be rich. That's the bottom line. And that's what I come back to every time. It's nice to do the details. If the details work for you, great. But all you got to do is buy and hold forever and you will be rich. That I can say confidently. Amen and amen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything else on this one, Chris? Let's see. No. Let's move over to the next tab because this is where it gets fun, I think. Yeah. Okay. So cool spreadsheet. That's it. We just take 15, 20 seconds, input a couple of numbers, and then we get all this neat stuff. Um, although I don't know why it's looking like that. Hold on a second. Looking like what? Yeah. No, it's okay. This was cut off, but I, it, actually everything else is fine. So now you see everything is white, so we can't input anything else. Real simple. And now we start getting... Uh, the, the outputs of the analysis. So we have the address, it's one unit, all this stuff looks familiar. You're putting in 71K. You can see here the annual rental income, the potential, another way of putting it, the potential annual rental income, if it was full the whole time, is 24,600, but it's not gonna be full the whole time. We're saying there'll be an average vacancy rate of 5%, giving our expected annual rental income of 23,370. So that's going to be our top line income. And then all this does is it adds all the expenses we put in. 
So here you have the total annual expense, income here, 23,000, expense, 4,400, giving the net operating income, which is all your income minus all your expenses for the year of $18,914. And then putting 25% down, it's really cool here actually, you can see the PI was uh, $1,056 uh, per month. The annual mortgage payment comes out to $12,676. Annual cash flow before taxes, $6,200. And now we get to some cool metrics that we can begin to compare properties on and also understand what our rate of return is. So for this client, this was a really important number, the cash on cash return. She put down, uh, I'm sorry, she, yeah, she put down $71,000. $895. That's what she put down when she bought the property. That's what she put in. Her expected annual cash flow before taxes is $6,238. That gives her a 9% return. It's a very, very important number. You go to US Bank, you get a CD or something, you're getting a 1% return. Is that good or bad? Neither. It just is. Safe, easy 1%. You buy this property, you're expecting a 9% return given all the inputs you made. Does that make sense, Chris? Anything you want to jump in on? Uh, it makes sense to me just to clarify something. You talked about the net operating income or NOI for short. How come right. the annual mortgage payments aren't included in the expenses? Because that's a monthly expense people have, right? Yeah, it's, the, it's just the way it's done. So net operating income... For the, especially for the purposes of cap rate is based upon owning the property outright. It's just, it's just, you can use whatever you want, but if you say NOI to someone who's done this for a while, they're going to make the assumption that that would be um, separate from the mortgage. And then of course, right here, the next thing we do is take out the mortgage to give you the annual cash flow before taxes. So it's somewhat semantic. It's just the way most people actually run it and work it. You get your NOA, NOI, minus your annual mortgage payments equals cash flow before taxes. Great. It's the way we do. You know, just somebody made it up 80 years ago and we're still doing the same thing. Then we have, okay, a cash on cash of 9% and then a cap rate of 7%. So the cap rate, and by the way, what's really cool, and I know I have a bunch of my agents on this as well. So the neat thing is that if you're showing this to a client and all of a sudden you panic and go, oh, shit, I can't remember what a cap rate is. Well, guess what? We actually put it right here for you. And, and I've been in the same position. Like all of a sudden I'm like freaking out like, oh, my God, a million times. <laughs> yeah. what was the cap rate again? Oh, yeah. It's the net operating income, 18914, divided by the purchase price right there to help you out. That's what makes this tool so simple. And it comes out to 7%. So, Chris, tell me what you think in the Denver market in 2018. What does the seven cap mean to you? It means I should buy it. Okay. Is it uh, how great a deal is it? I mean, it's not the greatest thing out there, but it's a very, very solid deal. Where if you look at from all the properties I've seen so far and been involved with, like it's a very, very solid deal. Where you know what? Yeah, you might be able to find something a lot better, or you might be able to find something better, but it's going to take more time, more work. And I would say you might be hitting the point of diminishing returns because you spend a lot more time, a lot more effort looking. Mm -hmm. You might get a little bit better than that, you know, if I, by finding an, uh, an MLS deal. And, you know, for a turnkey property where you have to replace the microwave and clean the carpets, like seven, a seven cap rates are a good deal in my book. So I would call it, it's like the Honda Civic of rental properties, right? It's not the Jaguar, but it's not the, you know, 72 Pinto. It's just a solid car. It's a solid deal. And I don't know, by coincidence, maybe I drive a Honda Civic. Like, it just makes sense. Who for this client? So you might come to me, or you might come to your agent and say, you know what? I want a nine and a half cap. That's what I want. I'm willing to do the work and take the time to get it and maybe even have to leave Metro Denver to get it. That's kind of what Chris is talking about in terms of the additional work. And then I would also include the additional uh, likelihood or unlikelihood you'll ever find the property you want and actually buy something. This is just that middle ground, the seven cap rate, the Honda Civic that with some effort you can buy, you can pay off over time and you can get rich. And that's just a lot of what we counsel people on. Figure out what you want and then go and do it. 
But if you read a book on real estate and you want the world's greatest deal and you think you're going to get it in two weeks, you're going to be very disappointed. That's the bad news. Seven cap rate, solid property. Turns out to be uh, a gross rent multiplier of 132, and the GRM is defined as the purchase price divided by the monthly rent, 132, about right for this market. And then the most sophisticated metric we have is we call the five-year after-tax return. It's also known as the internal rate of return for all you MBAs who are listening right now. And what this means is what we do is we actually – um, the calculation takes a deeper dive trying to understand the following. If you put $100 into this property, so let's just use, in, I know we put 71000 but let's just use a round number. Let's just say the $100. What the IRR, internal rate of return, means is at the end of year one, you're going to have $118. At the end of year two, you're going to have $118 times 1.18. You're going to be going up 18% Per year. And that is a truly remarkable number because what we're doing is we are making assumptions. And this, this particular spreadsheet is based on the assumptions and you can put in whatever assumptions you want. We're saying we expect prices to go up over the long term 5% per year and rents to go up over the long term 5% per year. Maybe you put six and six, maybe you put three and three and it'll change the number. But I'm comfortable, based on what I know, of saying 5% for rent increases, 5% for price increases. If you do that, and then also taking into consider depreciation and taxes, this is how you make so much money in real estate. So let me put it this way. If you know what the rule of 72 is, 72 divided by 18 is for, oh, it's exactly 72. I just made that up. It's literally 72. What this means is in this situation, the money you put in will be doubled every four years, believe it or not. And this is how people make so much money in real estate. And the vast majority of us, when we get into real estate, don't understand this. I didn't know this for the first 10 years of being an investor. I just knew I'd made a lot of money. But the internal rate of return is a, is a relatively sophisticated metric to actually put everything together and say, that $100 is going to go up, in this case, projected 18% per year. So you said- Let me stop. So let me ask you a few questions here. So it says it's going, you know, you'll double after four years. So does that mean the price of the condo doubles after four years or the amount that the investor puts down? The latter. So once again, it's like, well, let's just take the 71895. What this says is based upon the assumptions, the projections that we put in, which of course aren't going to be right. It might go up 7% a year. It might go up 3%. It might go down 2%. We don't know, but we've got to come up with our best guess. These are my best guesses. You take this spreadsheet, put whatever you want based on my best guesses. I bought a property a few months ago. These are literally the numbers I put in. It's my best guess. You know, I'm pretty good at this, but I'm just guessing. Based on the guesses, your 71,000 that you put in will double in four years based upon the appreciation as well as the rents and the rent increases as well as the depreciation that you save in your taxes. So there's a formula behind all of this, and this is what professionals use. If you're running a billion dollar REIT, you use internal rate of return. You might wanna, you might wanna look at cap rates and cash rate, cash on cash stuff, but it's the internal rate of return that you're most um, focused on because you want to know and project what, how your money is going to grow. And this, this is the segue, this, the internal rate of return is the segue into a greater and deeper understanding of your money. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we use cap rates and cash on cash because we're just looking at a house or a condo. We want to compare like ones, but the five-year after-tax return actually puts it all together and shows you what happens to your money. So Charles, we got a question here from Herb, and I'm not, I think I actually missed this in a different part of the window. He says... <laughs> Hey, Charles, and so if you could go back to the inputs tab, if I try to enter a 100% cash purchase in the, I'm sorry, Mr. Herb, if I try to enter a 100% cash purchase price in the worksheet, it doesn't seem to automatically adjust to eliminate financing costs, et cetera. What am I doing wrong? Thanks. You're using a spreadsheet that was put together by a lender. So go make your own spreadsheet. 
says it right there. So literally, that's what it is. So Joe's a lender. And, you know, I mean, he's doing this for people who, who want loans. So he has it calculated that you have to put a minimum of 15% down on a rental property. So here, what we're saying is, we're actually paying the 270 in cash because we're putting a 15, a 0% down payment. But this calculator, you've done nothing wrong, Herb. This calculator was just designed by a lender for people getting loans. So here's the workaround. Okay. I learned this from Joe. So, you know, if you go down the line 21 initial repair cost, uh, you can put in a negative. So keep it 0% and just oh. line 21 and, and put in negative like what 11,500. Or whatever the total know. investment is, and that will actually subtract it out. So if you add acquisition cost and or not probably just loan cost, if you subtract that out, it won't be down the dollar, but you can kind of mm -hmm. just do a very quick finagling and subtract out those financing costs. So that is a mm -hmm. workaround I learned from Joe a couple months ago when I was trying to do something else with a spreadsheet. Learn something new every single day. <laughs> That's great. Really cool. So ha thanks for the question. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, if you need additional, uh, Herb, feel free to touch base with Chris. He can walk you through that. Yeah. Okay, so that that takes you basically through screen one. I, I want to pretty much focus on that. If you get the spreadsheet, you'll see that now we can break it into 15-year analyses and do some really interesting things that we can get into details in, in a future webinar when we have more time. Just really want to start with the basics. So, Chris or anybody else, let me know if you have any additional questions on this, anything you want to run through. Um, but this is, this is where we start. Very, very powerful to be able to input a few things and be able to come out and have your cash on cash, your cap rate, your gross rent multiplier, and your internal rate of return right at your fingertips. And uh, Charles, I'm gonna steal your screen for a second, just yep. take it over so I can actually show people if they want some more advanced options and we'll get back to some questions here. Yep. So you can see my screen, right, Charles? Uh, actually, I have to actually move oh. this over. Well, it yes, like, I can. Okay, cool. Got so it. if you, I'll put this link in there, but if you, Basically, go to denverinvestmentrealestate.com, which is a website Charles and I run. Go to spreadsheets and rental property. You'll be at this page. There's three YouTube training videos. And if you come down to, I think it's this third one, the advanced tabs and what if. This is a video that Charles and Joe recorded, I think about a year ago, that goes through those additional tabs. So if you're eager to get into there, and you don't want to wait for the next webinar, just go here. And I think it's like a 20 minute or it's a 10 minute video there. You can watch it. And then Joe and Charles actually walk you through. So I'll put this link in the notes so everyone can grab it. All right, Charles, I'm going to put it back to your screen. Okay. So Brian asked a question. Let me, let me start with an answer. And then Brian, feel free to follow up. Happy to talk about this more because I love the question. On the lending side of things, a question for later if you prefer. You have a lot of useful go-to knowledge to reference. What resources would you recommend for someone who wants to build that knowledge and best understand lending across the board? Single family, small multifamily, commercial multifamily, spend a ton of time doing it. I actually became a lender. I started a lending company called Your Castle Real Estate and became a lender under it. I obsessed about lending and I think you should too. Sound like a smart guy. It's all about the lending. The lending makes or breaks you. And it's the mistake every investor, including me, makes early on. We think it's about getting a great deal and about knocking $10 off the price. It's not mathematical. It's about the lending. It's about lining up your situation, what you bring to the table, good and bad, and lining it up with what you're looking to achieve and working with the right lender. So the real answer is spend some time. Uh, I'd be happy to talk with you more about this. I can give you uh, several lenders to speak to. And the other thing is everything I just said, now you need to double it because you need to understand two different types of loans. You probably need to understand conventional loans, Fannie Faye, Freddie Mac, normal 15, 30 year, fully amortized loans. But you also probably wanna understand portfolio, commercial loans. So if a condo complex has more than 50% of their units are, are, are lived in by renters, you can't get a normal conventional loan, meaning you're going to have to work with the guarantees of the first banks, the Vectras, those type of commercial loans. And they're very good to work with, but they work differently. So um, let me let me stop with that. But number one, spend more time on the loans. 
The loans is what you want to get right. The loans is what distinguishes someone who makes it in real estate from someone who doesn't, which is why I love the question. And I'm bringing it up in front of everybody. Obsess about the lending and making sure that you're putting yourself in the right position to lend, working with the right lender to actually close a deal. And then understand there's at least two different groups you're going to have to work with, a conventional lender or potentially a commercial lender. Because lots of condo complexes cannot be, they're called non-warrantable. You can't get a loan from a conventional lender. Therefore, you want to also have relationships with local banks. Touch base. I'll, I'll throw some people at you you can talk to. And I will uh, I want to add a couple things that I have on the slate just as far as my uh, some content will be pushing out. And I agree with Charles, and I'm and I want to get to know as many lenders and banks around Denver for myself as an investor and help out my clients. So on our podcast channel a few weeks ago, Charles and I recorded interviews with three great local conventional lenders, uh, Joe Massey, Monty Glessner, and Steve Sprinkle. And then actually starting next week, I've got slated to record an interview with uh, John Welms over at First Bank, which is a local portfolio lender, which does more of the commercial side. And I'll also be interviewing some other commercial uh, lenders, local credit union lenders as well. And my plan here is I said, I want to get to know all these people. I want to learn all the nuances about how they work. So I'm going to record a podcast so everyone else can learn as well. So keep an eye out for those. I don't have an exact date for when they're coming out, but that is in the works. will be out over the next you know, couple of months. I'll be publishing them as, as they record. So I'm pretty much done with sort of prepared remarks. Any other questions, hit me. Want to keep it nice and short, nice and quick. Thank you for joining us. Um, Brian Richard said, awesome answer. Thanks. Someone sounds like one avenue is to speak with many different lenders. Yes. And learn what they offer. Yes. And how those products work. Yes. Are there any handy books about lending I could read without going the full path of becoming a lender myself? Um, probably. I don't know. Go to Amazon. I mean, I'm sure there are and I'm sure they're good. Um, so I, I don't want to discount. Yeah. Ha ha. Roger that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really like you should, yeah, learn. I, I just don't have any, like I learn by doing, I, if, if I, if I literally take my computer, I can show you what I did 20 years ago is I bought this many books on real estate and I read them. That was the right thing to do. I don't think I learned anything because then I made a bunch of mistakes. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I don't know. We actually wrote a book that I'd be happy to put, you know, get you a copy of. I think, Chris, we have it, an ebook, and I can send you a physical book that I think is actually quite good. Sure, learn some stuff, but don't think books are a substitute for talking to lenders and actually sitting with people and taking the time. At a minimum, it's both. And if it's only one or the other, do the second one. But of course, learning and understanding some of the terminology is very helpful as well. Yeah, I'd actually recommend like, I mean, definitely, you know, find some books or audio books or whatever, um, but reach out to lenders around town and banks and just say, hey, can I swing by your office and grab a cup of coffee with you for 30 minutes? I mean, most lenders are going to be more than happy to talk to someone that may be a client one day with them. So, you know, go out there, grab coffee and be polite and ask questions. And a lot of people be happy to sit down with you. Yep. That's been exactly. one of my uh, formulas over the years to learn and network. Be nice and grab coffee. Yep. Cool. Um, so he says, right, that makes perfect sense. Maybe some articles or something more appropriate for what I was thinking. Awesome. Well, I think we are out with questions. I know, Charles, you are got to leave in a few minutes because you are driving up north. So we're going to wrap things up. Charles, thank you for coming out. Everyone, thank you. thank you for coming out. I apologize for the mix up of times we had. Uh, with scheduling this webinar. Uh, if you guys have questions in the meantime, after this webinar, or want some of those resources we mentioned, the webinars, the book Charles wrote, the spreadsheet, just email Charles, email me. We'll be more than happy to help you out point to the right direction. All right, everyone. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks all.